Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Reinforcing Recovery with Contingency Management for Pregnant and Parenting People. We appreciate all of you taking your time to either view this live or archived as a production of Healthy Connections. For those of you unfamiliar with Healthy Connections, it is a martial health initiative and a collaborative community response aimed at supporting pregnant and parenting families struggling with substance use disorder. Together, all of the members of Healthy Connections strive to address the high rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome in our region and the resulting impact on child development and family stability. By integrating existing programs and services and fostering collaborations, the Healthy Connections Coalition enhances interagency efficiency through research, education, and collaboration to make a meaningful difference in our community. Healthy Connections is open to any organization interested in supporting these initiatives. You can learn more at marshallhealth.org slash healthy connections. Today's webinar is also being produced in conjunction with the West Virginia Behavioral Health Workforce and Health Equity Training Center at Marshall University, also known as the Training Center. This organization aims to support, develop, and expand the behavioral health workforce in West Virginia by increasing access to high-quality, evidence-based trainings at no cost to employ in attendees. Rather, The training center is funded by the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Services Bureau for Behavioral Health and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. To find out about even more upcoming events with the Training Center, please visit www.wvbhtrainings.org slash trainings. You can also contact Dr. Carrie Mika Laud at the address seen on your screen. The Training Center is also helping us by providing continuing education credits. For those of you attending live, you must be present for the entire webinar and complete our evaluation survey in order to receive continuing education credit. We'll put a link to the survey in the chat window toward the end of the training, so please be on the lookout for that as we do need it to be completed in order to provide CE credits. We do our best to send out CE certificates within 10 to 14 days of the live event, but know that sometimes there are delays. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat window and we'll do our best to address them throughout today's presentation. We'll also have a segment at the end of our keynote presentation for Q&As about the topic being presented today by our expert presenter. Our expert presenter is Dominic D. Philippus, a licensed clinical psychologist with more than 30 years of experience as a clinician, researcher, and educator, predominantly in the field of addiction treatment. He earned his PhD in clinical psychology in 1992 from Hanneman University in Philadelphia. He serves as the Deputy National Mental Health Director for Substance Use Disorders in the Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention in the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. He has particular interest and expertise in expanding access to evidence-based SUD treatment and measurement-based SUD care. He is a nationally recognized subject matter expert in contingency management, whose work in implementing has been published in peer-reviewed scientific journals and featured in media reports in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Scientific American, and National Public Radio. He is a trainer in motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy for substance use disorders and is also a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to turn today's web webinar over to Dominic De Filippis to talk about reinforcing recovery with contingency management for pregnant and parenting people. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate this opportunity. I want to thank uh, Marshall University, Marshall Health, the West Virginia Department of Human Services and Quality Insights for organizing and inviting me to uh, present today on contingency management. So let's get underway. 
There's a bit of a delay in the slide advancing, so uh, bear bear with me as we do this. So what I'm hoping uh, that all participants today will be able to do by the conclusion, whoops, by the conclusion of our uh, I'll go back to that objective slide. Hmm, it's not advancing backwards. Let's try that again. Ah, oh, there we go. Definitely challenges in the recovery from substance use disorder. Wow, so they really cause some challenges. Why don't, um, if someone on the slide control side can advance the map, might be better. There seems to be quite a delay in my advancing the slides. Perfect. All right. So, what I'm hoping you'll be able to do is uh, identify the challenges to recovery from substance use disorder, which really is the uh, milieu into which we'd be introducing contingency management, how the current crisis we're experiencing in the United States with methamphetamine use disorder really is an exemplar of these recovery challenges to which we will respond by making contingency management available. Then we'll speak specifically about the rationale, methods, and evidence for contingency management, its various applications to substance use disorder treatment, and refute some of the common critiques of seeing the next slide, please. So let's start with this challenge from uh, recovery from sun. Next slide. Okay, so on one level, the challenge that patients with substance use disorder, including but not limited to pregnant people, experience is a neurophysiological challenge. Now, where what, 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 am I, what am I referring to? What I'm referring to is the action, in particular, of stimulants on the brain and where the particular uh, mechanism of action is in the dopamine areas of the brain, which are associated with the experience of satisfaction, pleasure, or reward following behavior. Now, what happens is stimulants like cocaine and methamphetamine cause a surge in dopamine in those areas of the brain that lead to dysfunction. Next slide. So this test in neural cow at the National Institute on Drug Abuse reveals that chronic use of stimulants in a patient with stimulant use disorder are manifest in deficits or dysfunction in the dopamine areas of the brain. On the left side is a patient without a history of stimulant, chronic stimulant use whose dopamine areas lit up in green and orange and yellow are active. Whereas the people with stimulant use disorder, those same dopamine areas of the brain are less active. Now, what does that mean at an experiential level? What that means is the patient with stimulant use disorder with dysfunction in his or her dopamine areas of the brain will have difficulty experiencing as satisfying those activities that are typically associated with a recovery lifestyle, a sober lifestyle, spend time with loved ones. Enjoying a nice meal, going to work, having hobbies, and so forth. Those activities which enrich uh, the life of a person covering a soul are less appealing, less attractive, less satisfying to a patient whose dopamine areas of the brain have been rendered dysfunctional by chronic stimulant use. Next slide. Now, the good news is that that slide reveals is that with uh, absence from stimulants, you can see a recovery of dopamine function. One month after stimulant absence, there's some degree of recovery, and then 14 months, there's near return to normal dopamine functioning. But what does that mean at an experiential level? That means that if we could promote abstinence in a patient with a stimulant use disorder like amphetamine use disorder or cocaine use disorder, and we can sustain that absence, the brain will heal such that the patient can then experience a satisfying those activities, behaviors, and lifestyle that's typically associated with recovery, so that when we withdraw any external supports like contingency management, those naturally occurring rewards that come from recovery can sustain the behavior change. Next slide. 
Um, sorry to interrupt uh, today. We're getting a, a little bit of uh, audio problems. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, for that, if um, uh, someone on our end uh, could let me know, are, are you experiencing audio problems from me speaking as well? It looks like I sound clear. So my apologies, uh, Dominic. I'm not sure why, but your audio was fine before okay. we started, but we're getting a little choppiness. So um, I don't oh, know if maybe... Okay. I wonder if... Oh, you sound better now. So. Um... Okay, I'll, I'll maybe maybe there were some uh, maybe some in connectivity issues uh, are uh, causing some difficulty. Well, please interrupt again and and uh, let me know if there's any uh, continued challenges with the audio. Okay, we okay. will. And so Beth we fixed have it. a. All right, I didn't do anything, but <laughs> we'll take the <laughs> we'll take serendipity <laughs> as it awesome. comes. Thank um, you. In addition. Uh, to the uh, neurological, neurophysiological challenges, there's also a treatment attrition challenge. So part of our, our mission is to assist patients in initiating and sustaining abstinence. Of course, the problem there is that whereas substance use disorders or chronic illnesses and chronic illnesses respond best to continuing uninterrupted seamless care, the experience of so many patients is that substance use disorder care is often episodic. There's a high rate of attrition from treatment. Rates as high as 70% after just four sessions of care, which suggests that that's certainly insufficient time to support the type of enduring abstinence needed for the brain healing that I was just referring to. Add to that the fact that when patients cycle in and out through treatment, have psychic experiences of treatment, as anyone who has uh, treated patients with substance use disorder know, such patients often return to care in a clinical condition more severe than their prior baseline. They'll see higher levels of care, costlier levels of oh, It's shy again. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. Well, the last time when I spoke, it appeared to make it better. So uh, one suggestion I was going to have, if you're connected on a VPN uh, network, um, we found that occasionally disconnecting from the VPN while you deliver the slides uh, will not disconnect your Zoom, but will uh, okay. sometimes help. I'm going to try that. If we do get disconnected, stand by and I will do my best to reconnect. Excellent. Thank you. And sorry for the technical issues. Okay, am I back, and are you able to hear me? Uh, at the moment, yes. Uh, it seems like this is working. So, um, so we'll we we will stand by, and our apologies for the uh, issues. Okay, uh, please stand by. We're still uh, trying to resolve the Zoom issues. Our apologies for this uh, today. Um, I don't know if you can hear us, Dominic, but we can uh, try to resume again. I do hear you. Are you hearing me? I hear you. Are you hearing me? Yes. Hear you, but it's choppy. 
Okie choppy. I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to try from an alternative computer that I think will be. Uh... It seems like it's better now. I don't know. Okay, well, uh, while Dominic's getting uh, reconnected, just want to thank everybody again for joining us today for this. Do know that the uh, slides will be archived and we will be sharing a edited recording of this with uh, better audio. So uh, we really appreciate everybody's patience as we uh, get, get these issues uh, worked out. So please stand by. I am reconnected. Are you hearing me? Loud and clear. I think we've right. done it. We hear you. Uh, yeah, sometimes Zoom doesn't play well in the VA sandbox, so I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> no so I'm going to go at a more accelerated pace now, so forgive me for that. But we have a treatment attrition challenge. So obviously, if treatment is episodic, we're less likely to be able to provide enduring supports for abstinence that lead to the brain healing that would then uh, permit the patient to experience a satisfying recovery associated behaviors. Next slide, please. Well, if those two challenges weren't daunting enough, patients are, with substance use disorder are also challenged at a cognitive behavioral level. And, and I think this challenge is well captured by the, albeit cliched, but I think appropriate metaphor of the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other. From the perspective of a patient with a substance use disorder, substance use is like the devil on one shoulder, very seductively inviting the patient to engage in substance consumption because the reinforcements, the rewards associated with substance use are potent and immediate. Oh, by the way, their, their harmful consequences, the aversive punitive consequences, while potent, are often delayed and uncertain. At the same time, you have the angel of recovery on the patient's shoulder saying, hang in there, hold on to your, to your recovery. Things will improve over time. Your relationships will improve. Your finances will improve. You'll be less likely to suffer health consequences and die. Oh, by the way, in the immediate aftermath of your decision to, to choose a recovery lifestyle, you're likely to feel awful. You'd have likely to have withdrawal symptoms, a more lucid, clear-eyed view of the devastated landscape that is your life brought on by substance use disorder, loss of, of social networks, all unpleasant consequences, immediately unpleasant consequences of the choice to pursue recovery. So that really lays out the, the challenge, which is we know that immediacy of reinforcement is absolutely crucial for initiating and sustaining behavior, the challenge is to therefore make recovery immediately reinforcing. Next slide, please. Well, methamphetamine is a good exemplar of these challenges. Next slide. If you look at this slide, this comes from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Look at the short-term effects. They tend to be the positively reinforcing effects of methamphetamine, immediately reinforcing. And the longer-term uh, effects are delayed. The, 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 the uh, harmful consequences of methamphetamine use are often delayed and therefore not as influential on behavior. Next slide. Well, contingency management embraces that challenge. It, it, it essentially acknowledges that our patients or patients with substance use disorder face this daunting challenge that substance use is very attractive because of its immediate powerful reinforcing qualities and its negative effects are delayed and uncertain. Recovery on the other hand, the landscape is reversed. In, uh, the long-term consequences of recovery are very beneficial and very potent, but the immediate consequences are often unpleasant. So how does contingency management ma help meet that challenge? Next slide. Well, it, it does so by making early recovery rewarding, and, and it does so by making immediate 
reliable reinforcement for a patient who engages in recovery supportive behaviors like abstaining from substances or engaging in other recovery activities like attending treatment or adhering to medications for substance use disorder. And by doing so, it engages those patients in treatment, gives their brains a chance to heal. And again, with that healing comes the ability to experience as satisfying again, a recovery lifestyle. And when you reinforce the target behavior with CM, whatever it may be, you're getting de facto reinforcement of the patient's retention and care because in order to secure the reinforcement associated with the target behavior, the patient must, of course, remain engaged in treatment. Next slide. Well, the fundamental principles that undergird contingency management, I like to say, you probably already know. They're, they're right there in a Psych 101 textbook. And they really are the therapeutic procedural application of principles of operant conditioning. Yes, the same operant conditioning. And that was elucidated by historical figures in behavioral science like uh, B.F. Skinner, and then later applied to human behavior. Now, you look at that slide, you might say, all right, you had me for a while there, Dom, but how is it possible that what we learn from animal learning, rats and pigeons, in exquisitely controlled environments like an operant chamber or Skinner box, as they came to be known. How could that possibly apply to human, the human behavioral experience where we don't live in such exquisitely controlled situations? Well, that's where assiduous attention and adherence to the procedures of contingency management is essential. The, adhering to the procedures, crafts, if you will, or builds, if you will, the virtual operant chamber, the virtual Skinner box, we're essentially establishing a virtual lever of, say, abstinence, that when the patient engages that lever in treatment, they receive immediate reinforcement. Next slide. Well, that sounds at a conceptual level pretty easy. You reward patients when they engage in healthy behavior. Isn't that the whole ball of wax? Well, yes, conceptually that's true, but the devil is in the procedural details. How you do CM makes all the difference in the world. And this quote from B.F. Skinner is actually quite prescient. And what B.F. Skinner says is, the way you do positive reinforcement, that is providing a reinforcing or rewarding consequence followed by a recovery behavior, the way you do that is more important than the amount. Now, at first blush, that almost sounds counterintuitive. Wait a minute. The size of the reward is not as important as the methods of delivering it? While that might sound counterintuitive, thank goodness it's true. Because if we had to match at an equal level the reinforcing quality of stimulants like cocaine, or methamphetamine, I can't even imagine how large the reinforcements would have to be. Thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of value. And why do I suggest that? Because we know patients will often expend resources to that level in order to secure uh, substances for consumption. Next slide. Well, what could go wrong when you're trying to do CM? Well, one of the things that go wrong is you don't define and appropriately measure a behavior, so you don't know whether it occurred or not. And if you can't unequivocally, unambiguously know, along with the patient being treated, when the behavior occurred and when it didn't occur, you have no idea whether to provide reinforcement or withhold it. If your consequences are inconsistent, or delayed, that also can affect the learning. For example, the consequences of recovery, while very potent, greater likelihood of living, improved relationships, improved finances, very, very large, potent consequences, very attractive, but they are delayed and therefore not as influential on behavior. And don't take my word for it. Let's for a moment just consider a behavior that, that is more why even more widely uh, 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 prevalent in America, tobacco use. 
you'd be hard pressed to find a person who uses tobacco, whether it be cigarettes or chewing tobacco, who's unaware of the consequences, the negative health effects of those behaviors. It would be, in fact, it would be almost impossible to avoid awareness given the presence of Surgeon General's warnings on the, the products themselves. Yet, those consequences are not terribly influential on behavior because they are uncertain and delayed. Another consequence or another challenge could be if tangible reinforcement in CM is not utilized. If you relied on affirmations or praise alone, you're less likely to get good uh, effective learning. Not that praise and affirmations are not effective, not that symbolic reinforcement like uh, certificates or ball caps or coffee mugs or tokens uh, 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 symbolizing progress in recovery. Those can be very, very potent and attractive reinforcers, but they're not broadly attractive to patients. So for some patients, they may be uh, sufficient, for others, not so much. And often reinforcement when it's available is, is, is not very high magnitude. I mentioned that Skinner quote, magnitude is less important than, than procedure, but magnitude is important in and of itself. Inadvertently rewarding the problem behavior. Now you might say, now hold on a second. How could I possibly make that mistake? If the patient is abstinent and I have verification of the abstinence by way of a drug test, how could I reward the problem behavior of substance use? Well, imagine if the availability of that test result was delayed so that such that if today I provided a sample, a urine sample to the clinic to be tested for the presence of stimulants, and then I receive a, a reinforcer, but that test result wasn't available till tomorrow. And you explain to me, I need to come back tomorrow for my reward if the test is negative. I return the next day and let's say my test is indeed negative, but unbeknownst to you, this evening or sometime after I provided the sample, I consumed stimulants. We'd be providing a reward based on a test result that no longer reflects my current clinical status I've recently used. And then finally, setting the bar too high or too low. Setting it too high is asking a variety of, of accomplishments from the patient in order to secure reinforcement. That typically comes in the form of requiring that the patient test negative across all substances, alcohol, cocaine, methamphetamine, opioids, benzodiazepines, and on and on and on. Now you might say, well, isn't that the goal? Isn't total abstinence the healthiest behavior of all? Well, sure, but it's also a very, very complex behavior. And what do we know about very complex behaviors? They are best initiated, initiated by way of shaping. So instead of setting the bar at total abstinence right away, we set it at abstinence from the target substance and the effect can generalize from there. Setting it too low would be, for example, relying on a means of determining the behavior occurred, that's not objective. Relying exclusively on self-report versus verification by urine drug testing. Now, now, that's not an indictment of patients with substance use disorder and their candor, but it is an indictment of the stigma still associated with substance use disorder that often places patients in, in a sense of compulsion to or shame and guilt about disclosing substance use. And as long as stigma remains, then the, the risk that it poses to patient candor cannot be ignored. Whereas with objective uh, testing, we can verify the behavior with confidence. Next slide. Well, how does CM work? This is the most important slide of the entire deck in terms of understanding the mechanics of CM. And what you'll see, or what you are seeing in this slide are the four active ingredients of CM derived from operant conditioning. Our first order of business, we have to identify what behavior we want to reinforce. Now, thankfully in the treatment of substance use disorder, we have a behavior that for the most part is quintessentially associated with recovery, abstinence from the substance. Now you might say, 
hold on a second, Dom, what about harm reduction? You know, not all patients embrace an abstinence approach. Well, CM does not compel, coerce, or require a patient to be abstinent. All it says is if, if the patient chooses to be abstinent, the CM process is there to provide immediate reinforcement. There's no compulsion associated with it. It's the presentation of an opportunity. In addition to identifying the target behavior, we next our next order of business is objectively and frequently monitoring it so we know when it occurs and when it doesn't occur so we could provide and withhold reinforcement respectively. We do so with objective, rapidly available drug testing, for example, point of care testing. When the patient tests negative, here's the first ingredient. We provide immediate, tangible, desirable reinforcement. Pos the, the concept of positive reinforcement from operant conditioning. But we don't stop there, we escalate, we increase the size of that reinforcement for consistent performance of the behavior. In other words, as the patient provides consecutive urine samples that test negative for stimulants, the amount of the reinforcement, the amount of the reward grows in size. Now, why do we do that? We do that because the science in CM has shown that escalating the size of the reinforcement results in, is more likely to result in consistent performance of the behavior. Well, why is that important? Harken back to those first slides. We're looking to, to promote consistent abstinence because that promotes the brain healing and the restoration of dopamine functioning in the brain that will allow the patient in the long run to experience a satisfying a recovery lifestyle. So we have escalating positive reinforcement. We also withhold reinforcement when the target behavior does not occur. That's the textbook definition of extinction. Why do we include extinction as the second active ingredient? Because it is the most effective learning contingency to weaken a behavior. So we've got the escalating positive reinforcement strengthening the abstinence. We've got the extinction weakening the drug taking behavior. We don't stop there. We also introduce a mild punishment. When the patient does not test negative, the amount of reinforcement that that patient had escalated to with consistent abstinence is reset to the starting level. That is a penalty, if you will, a textbook definition of a punisher. The punishment also weakens the drug-taking behavior upon which it is contingent. And by introducing that third ingredient of punishment, a mild punisher, albeit, we introduce the fourth ingredient, negative reinforcement. That is, reinforcement by avoidance of the reset. So in total, we have positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement strengthening the abstinence. From the patient's perspective, I want to abstain because of what I stand to gain and because it, I avoid the reset. We have extinction and the punisher weakening the drug taking behavior. So we have four active ingredients simultaneously strengthening recovery and weakening substance consumption. Next slide. Okay, well, what behaviors are we gonna reinforce? I've mentioned abstinence, is that the only behavior? Well, it's certainly the behavior for which the largest body of scientific evidence supporting CM effectiveness resides. But because CM is a therapeutic procedural application of operant conditioning, really, in theory, any volitional behavior can be a target of CM. But again, the devil's in the details, the procedural details, how we define and monitor that behavior to support the provision or withholding of the reinforcement in an immediate fashion makes all the difference. And also, the target behavior must be a behavior that the patient can successfully perform. Otherwise, it would be an exercise in frustration. Now, in substance use disorder treatment, there are two recovery behaviors that can be 
monitor reliably and validly, objectively and frequently. Abstinence, as I've mentioned, and treatment attendance. However, in CM, you get the behavior you reinforce. So if you reinforce abstinence, you're more likely to promote abstinence behaviors in with the patient. If you reinforce treatment attendance, you're, you're likely to see an increase in sustainment of attendance, but not necessarily abstinence. Hence, reinforcing abstinence is really the, the, the biggest return on CM investment, because when we reinforce abstinence, we are getting that de facto reinforcement of treatment attendance. And think about it from a treatment attendance standpoint. You might say, yeah, but that seems so easy to do. It's so easy to verify if the patient is physically present, you reinforce, whereas with abstinence, you have to do testing. Well, even something as seemingly straightforward as attendance can get complicated in, in an application of CM. For example, say I was reinforcing patients for attending a group therapy session, and John Doe attends today's session and promptly falls asleep during group. Well, technically, John met the contingency. He attended the treatment, though he fell asleep. So. The definition that, that defining and monitoring the behavior is something that you have to pay exquisite attention to, again, because we're crafting that virtual operant chamber. Now, other behaviors, medication adherence, very appropriate targets for CM, but the monitoring can be complicated. Do you do blister packs? Do you do medication pill counts? Really, the gold standard for medication adherence in CM is recordings, video recordings of the patient self-administering his or her medication. Of course, the challenge there is the patient has to conduct the recording, submit that recording in it, presumably a secured link, and then someone on the therapy team must rapidly review that recording and then remotely deliver reinforcement once the patient's adherence is verified. That becomes a bit of a logistic challenge. Now, other recovery activities, like, for example, therapy homework, homework in cognitive behavioral therapy for substance use disorder, is another type of behavior that can be reinforced. But again, it gets kind of tricky and murky. Is it, how, how do we define completion of a, of, a, of a homework assignment? Is it the quantity of the homework produced, the quality of the homework produced, the timeliness of the homework produced? It gets, it can get tricky in terms of the def definition and monitoring of the behavior. Whereas with abstinence, the test does the heavy lifting for us. Next slide. Well, I mentioned stimulants as the uh, substance for which, and uh, substance use disorder, for which the largest body of evidence exists, but as, a, as an application of operant conditioning, can you apply CM to other substances? Well, we apply it uh, preferentially to stimulants because that's where the evidence is, because the need is greatest there. Bear in mind that with stimulant use disorder, we really don't have frontline medications for the, the treatment of the, the disorder. There are no FDA approved medications and even the medications that, that have some signal of efficacy in the empirical literature are not considered as effective as contingency management. And also st for stimulants, the implementation itself is, is the most straightforward because we can detect stimulants in urine with just twice weekly testing because the test so the testing schedule is yoked to the detection window of stimulants in urine. So if, if we do testing twice a week and those testing days are separated by roughly 72 hours, we will surveil the entire week of behavior such that any substance, any stimulant use by the patient during that time will result in at least one of those tests being positive and consistent abstinence would be revealed by both tests being negative. Cannabis, there is a growing body of evidence for cannabis. It gets complicated, though, because THC has a very lengthy detection window. I'm sure you've experienced it in your work with patients. THC among chronic users of cannabis 
can be detected four to six weeks, sometimes even longer after cessation has commenced. That can be a major complication in contingency management. There are adjustments you can make to the protocol, but again, with stimulants, much more straightforward. Well, what about alcohol? It's the most prevalent of all substance use disorders. It is the most cost costly in terms of health uh, impacts and financial impacts and productivity impacts. Why not alcohol? Well, there is a growing body of evidence on the efficacy of, of CM for alcohol. Some great work is being done by Dr. Michael McDonnell and his colleagues at Washington State University in Spokane, Washington. However, targeting alcohol can be complicated and impractical because if we use breath sampling and blood alcohol content derived from breath sampling, the detection window for breath sampling is roughly six to 12 hours. So if we're truly going to monitor abstinence, we would have to surveil the patient daily, which is really not feasible in an outpatient program. There is a metabolite, ethylglucuronide. You may test for it in your own surveillance with patients. It is very promising. It has a detection window similar to stimulants, 24 to 72 hours. The problem is we don't have a rapid test for it. Dr. McDonald and his colleagues in Washington State are using desktop analyzers to provide immediate results for ETG. However, those analyzers can be quite costly, upwards of $30,000 per analyzer. Once rapid point of care tests are available, test cups or test strips that provide immediate results, then it could be much more practical to uh, apply contingency management to an outpatient uh, 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 surveillance or outpatient implementation of, con of contingency management. Now, opioids. Clearly, opioids are the principal driver of the crisis of fatal overdose in the United States. However, in terms of the frontline treatment, and I, I put this in bold type to reinforce this notion, the medications, the FDA-approved medications for opioid use disorder, methadone, buprenorphine and buprenorphine combination products like buprenorphine naloxone, and extended release naltrexone are the life-saving frontline treatments for opioid use disorder, and they also offer greater safety than contingency management. Now, why do I say that? Because say you were to reinforce opioid abstinence with contingency management without the medication on board. And of course, if the medication's on board, how do we differentiate non-medicinal methadone versus medicinal methadone, non-medicinal buprenorphine from medicinal buprenorphine? The problem is if the patient abstains from the opioids, from, from uh, non-medicinal opioids, their tolerance will decrease. And if they have a recurrence of use, they're in greater danger of a fatal overdose. There is a possibility of applying contingency management to patients with who are receiving extended release naltrexone. You could reinforce their adherence to extended release naltrexone. You could reinforce their adherence to extended release buprenorphine. However, you want to have those medications on board because not only are they the most effective, they all also offer the greatest safety. The other challenge with surveilling opioids is we don't have a rapid, reliable, and valid test for fentanyl. And if you can't surveil fentanyl in an application of a treatment for opioid use disorder, you're not going to effectively determine if, it's a, if the treatment is having its desired impact. Next slide. All right, I mentioned that we don't wanna set the bar too high, total abstinence. Instead, we select a single drug or drug class, a stimulant or stimulants. And the reason why we don't do that, as I mentioned, is shaping. Now, although abstinence is the healthiest goal, again, the, the challenge with setting the bar at total abstinence is we forego two important learning principles that are absolutely essential for learning success. The consistent availability of reinforcement and shaping. Take, for example, a patient for whom you have established a total abstinence contingency. Well, if that patient has a great weekend and does not use any stimulants, but they may have taken a spouse's benzodiazepine in order to fall asleep 
or they may have used some cannabis, that patient knows that come Monday CM session, they will not receive reinforcement. The opportunity to strengthen that stimulant abstinence is lost. And therefore, the shaping of total abstinence is lost along with it. Well, that's the rationale. What about the evidence? Well, the evidence is clear. Meta-analysis by Lucier and colleagues demonstrates that single drug CM actually produces superior, superior outcomes to a multi-drug total abstinence approach to CM. Next slide. There are two CM protocols that, that uh, uh, are evidence-based. The, the, the more long-standing one is called voucher CM. And in voucher CM, patients earn prescribed and escalating dollar values of reward for consistent performance of the behavior, for consistent abstinence verified by consecutive negative urine samples, drug uh, verified by drug testing. It's a very effective approach to CM. The, the advantages of the voucher CM approach is that you could set hard caps on earnings. You could establish the protocol such that the patient can only earn a certain max, predefined maximum value. That's very important because there are current regulations from the Department of Health and Human Services regarding how much a patient can earn in a year. You could add bonuses that for every fourth consecutive sample that's negative, the patient earns an additional voucher. And it includes all the active ingredients of CM, the extinction, when the abstinence is not uh, uh, confirmed, no voucher is earned. The punishment, that's resetting the value of the vouchers of, with the presentation of a positive sample. And it also includes what we call a restoration feature that if a patient were to have a recurrence of use, and therefore receive no voucher that day and have their voucher value reset, there's an opportunity for the patient to get back to the, the escalated level of reinforcement without having to climb that ladder fully again. That restoration feature is there to offset the possibility of what Alan Marlat, the developer of the relapse prevention model of, of treatment, calls the abstinence violation effect, the idea that oh my gosh, I've blown it. I've undone all the, the work I've put in to my recovery. There's a little bit of background noise. I don't know if anyone's hearing that. Uh, no, uh, not hearing it on our end. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Uh, no problem. Just uh, might be just interference on my side of the, uh, of the connection. We could go to the next slide though. Now, voucher CM is a very effective protocol. The challenge with voucher CM. Kind of good. Mike is just listening out into this press conference. So I just wanted to call you to see if the role was going for us to do our on cams. Okay. Did anyone else hear that? <laughs> yes, now we did hear that. I'm not sure oh, where that is deriving from. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to interrupt a press conference. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds very important. <laughs> Um, but we'll again we'll we'll forge ahead uh, uh, in the There's for the sake of bridge collapse, uh, definitely hearing more more inter, inter, interruptions. I'll try to talk over it and again uh, uh, apologize for the interference. Say the Baltimore bridge collapse caused by oh yeah, this is uh, I'm hearing the news about the uh, tragedy in Baltimore with the collapse of the bridge. Is there any way to mute other mics? Um, I believe it looked like it was coming from your connection because actually all of our participants are muted at this right. time. Let me see. I, I don't think I have any other. Let me, I may have hey. to reconnect. Stand by. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Are you still with me? Yes, we are. Still yeah, that here. must have been an open channel I had on a window I did not see. Um, I, again, I apologize for that. Switched computers without clearing all the windows. Um, try CM. Now, the challenge with voucher CM is that it is very effective. However, the problem with it was that the early studies showed that patients could earn upwards of $1,000 to $1,200 in reinforcement. Now, you might say, Dom, that's not a problem. 
$1,200 to arrest the stimulant use disorder? That's cheap. That, that The trade-off is great. And I'd agree with you as a clinician, if we could arrest stimulant use disorder for uh, uh, $1,200 per patient, it would be a terrific financial trade-off. But good luck implementing that in a publicly funded program uh, where it would be difficult to set aside up to $1,200 in reinforcement per patient. Now, later studies about your CM showed that it could be effective for reinforcing abstinence with uh, voucher uh, maximums uh, 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 of roughly $500. But again, the challenge still remained. Well, for the longest time, that was thought to be an immutable trade-off of an effective treatment. You have to basically provide the reinforcement. I like to say, and this may date me, it, the lamentations were like Captain Kirk yelling to Scotty, I need more warp power and, Sc power and Scotty saying, I cannot change the laws of physics, Captain. Well, we can't change the law of effect. I, I call it the Jerry Maguire principle. If you want the behavior, you got to show the patient the reinforcement, the money. Well, that was true until a, a genius by the name of Nancy Petrie, the late great Nancy Petrie came along. And Nancy Petrie said, I have a way that we can reduce costs in CM without sacrificing efficacy. And as is the case with most true geniuses, she saw the answer hiding in plain sight. Instead of the patient earning prescribed and escalating dollar values of reinforcement, in PRICM, the patient earns prescribed and escalating opportunities for higher value reinforcement. Those opportunities coming in the form of draws of price slips, the price slips having the denominations I'm, I'm showing on the slide, and those price slips are maintained in a container, typically a plastic fishbowl, hence this came to bear the moniker fishbowl CM. And it has all the ingredients of contingency management's operant conditioning principles. It has the escalation. As the patient consecutively abstains, the patient draws higher numbers of slips. It has the extinction. When the abstinence is not verified, the patient earns no draws. And when the patient is not abstinent, the draws are reset. So it has that punitive feature and the negative reinforcement that accompanies it. And the average cost for patients in a 12-week course of CM, which is the standard length, is about $200. Now, uh, in VA, we've recently raised the value of the small slips from $1 to $3 to accommodate for, the, for inflation and costs over time, cost of living over time. So those numbers have now changed from Instead of average cost of roughly 200, it's now average cost of roughly 200, 250 to $300. Now you might say, well, why would anyone use voucher CM if price CM is equivalently effective and lower cost? Because there are patient treatment matching considerations. Some patients prefer and find more reinforcing the, the prescribed uh, uh, secure knowledge of voucher CM. They know exactly how much they will receive for each performance of the target behavior. Other patients like the mystery and excitement associated with prize CM. So both protocols being equally effective have a role in national consideration of implementation of contingency management. Next slide. So which protocol do you choose? They're both uh, effective. With voucher CM, it's easy to set caps. That's very important under the current regulatory considerations. It's predictable reinforcement. So for some patients, that is very reassuring. I know I'm going to get $20 in reinforcement for today's negative sample, but it's a double-edged sword to some degree because one patient might perceive that $20 as, wow, and another patient might perceive that $20 as, huh, not so great. Um, whereas with price CM, the patient might earn nothing if the price slips that patient draws that day are all affirmations or words of encouragement, what we call the good job slips, or the patient can earn a very high value reward up to $100 if they draw the jumbo slip. Both protocols are self-correcting. And what I mean by that 
is both protocols have a have a precaution built in for for the situation, the, the legitimate concern of diversion of incentives to support substance use. If a patient were to divert their incentives in CM to purchase substances, what would happen in CM? Well, that patient would then test positive, receive no reinforcement, have the reinforcement reset. So in some in, in a very real way, CM provides some degree of protection against diversion of incentives. Next slide. Eligibility. The eligibility for CM is dependent on the patient having a, the indicated condition, a diagnosis of stimulant use disorder. But you don't want to require patients to provide a urine sample that's positive for, for stimulants we don't want to uh, create an unintentional incentive for the patient to use stimulants in order to access contingency management. For patients with comorbid opioid use disorder, it's generally recommended that you begin the CM when the patient has already initiated at least two to three days of abstinence from stimulants. Why? Because patients with comorbid opioid and stimulant use disorder tend to be a higher severity population of patients. And if you don't start those patients with a negative sample, oftentimes those patients have difficulty achieving that first negative and they wind up expending a large portion of their CM course before they get the first negative sample and there isn't much course remaining for them to escalate in their reinforcement. In terms of repeated courses of CM, we really don't have any empirical evidence to support whether uh, repeated courses are a good idea or not a good idea. In VA, we took a cautious approach. We generally consider CM a one and done treatment opportunity. The idea being Mot uh, try to evoke motivation to, for the patient to make his or her best effort at CM. Also, we don't want the, the uh, patient to rapidly cycle through CM, to come in, uh, do three weeks, disengage from treatment, another three weeks, disengage from treatment, because that would undermine the principal goal of CM, producing the lengthiest duration of abstinence, which we know is associated with recovery, uh, uh, both at the neurological level that I spoke of earlier, and also the development of self-efficacy, the sense of I can do this and it's worth doing. Does that mean repeated courses of CM are forbidden? No. What we do in VA is we consider second courses as long as there's been a cooling off period, if you will, from the first course to the next one. We don't, again, want that rapid cycling. We certainly don't want the provision of CM to, in, in, in an unintentional way, reward the recurrence of use. The idea that, well, I had a recurrence of use, but at least I get back into CM. We also would encourage treatment providers to consider whether the second course of CM is a superior option than the uh, than an alternative evidence-based treatment, for example, like cognitive behavioral therapy for substance use disorder. And then finally, is the second course of CM likely to have a better prognosis than the first course? The idea being, do we, we don't want to repeat a treatment that is ineffective. However, second courses can be far more effective than the first, especially if there's reason to think that the patient's circumstances have changed. Perhaps they're better engaged in treatment now. They're housing stable now. They've disengaged from problematic relationships that were functional to their substance use. Under those circumstances, the CM may have a better opportunity to, to promote recovery. Next slide. Some of the procedural concerns, you need to be able to have a testing regime with immediate results. Any provider can administer CM. There's no, it's not discipline specific. You have to be able to resource reinforcement. That's a challenge. In VA, it's in our budget. We don't, we don't have to worry about external sourcing of reinforcement. Frequency of sessions is typically twice a week. Again, yoked to the detection window of stimulants in urine. CM can be combined with any other treatment. With in I, uh, intensive outpatient programs, standard outpatient programs, residential settings, inpatient programs, and can serve as a bridge from one program to another. 
What are some of the contraindications? If a patient's on a medication that could produce a false positive test result for the target, that could be uh, a challenge. If test results can be used punitively, that also presents a challenge because because from the patient's perspective, if in a twice weekly surveillance, any substance use is likely to be detected. And if th that detection results in punishment, then the CM becomes more of a threat or a risk than an opportunity for uh, support for their recovery. And then, as I mentioned earlier, if the patient has recently uh, 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 had CM, you would consider uh, that cooling off period. Next slide. Some organizational concerns, being able to implement point of care drug testing, changing the clinic culture from perceiving urine drug testing not as uh, an opportunity to catch the patient doing something wrong, but an opportunity for the patient to demonstrate what he or she is, a, is, is successfully accomplishing. From a a persecutorial uh, culture to a reinforcement and encouragement culture. The vital importance of training and coaching. The, the, the challenge with CM is all in, in, as I mentioned, very strict adherence to the procedures. Training and coaching can help secure that. As I, as I like to say, even the best athletes in the world, LeBron James benefits from coaching. The best musicians uh, uh, benefit from coaching, so can CM implementers. Being able to administer CM in a telehealth environment is also a, a challenge. Bear in mind that urine drug testing really is not appropriate for a telehealth administered CM because uh, uh, obviously we can't conduct your urine drug testing at a distance with immediate results, but oral fluid drug testing may be a viable option. Of course, you also need the ability to remotely and immediately reinforce patients' abstinence or performance of the recovery behavior. There are apps that are are are, are uh, being developed or have been developed that that can bridge that gap. And then, of course, any implementer of contingency management who does so in the community would want to attend to the regulations and the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector Generals final rule of December 2020 that spells out the legal and regulatory landscape when using incentives in healthcare. Next slide. What are some of the criticisms of CM that may be made in good faith and understandable under, uh, under that circumstance, but can be refuted? Next slide. One might be, you know what, Don, you've, you've, uh, decorated CM with a lot of psychobabble and refer re references to operant conditioning. But at the end of the day, all you're telling me is that you're bribing patients. Well, actually, no, we're not. Uh, CM doesn't even meet the basic definition of bribery. When I bribe someone, I'm offering them financial or material incentives to engage in a behavior often unethical and illegal that serves my, the payor's best interest and puts both the payee and the payor in legal and ethical jeopardy. CM is nothing of the sort. With CM, we're applying reinforcement using empirically validated procedures to strengthen recovery behaviors that are in the patient's best interest. And if, if the concern is the moral hazard of providing incentives for recovery behaviors, consider the moral hazard of withholding a treatment for a condition that we know is life-threatening, a condition like stimulant use disorder, for which CM is not just an effective treatment, but the most effective treatment available. Next slide. All right, maybe you're not bribing them, Tom, but I don't like the idea of paying people to do what they ought to do, what they we should be internally motivated to do. Well, I actually have a, a bit of a, 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 a concern and critique about using the term pay. CM is not paying someone. I pay someone. I am compensating that person for their labor and material in performing a service for me. I pay the auto mechanic to repair my vehicle. That is not what's going on in CM. With CM, we are providing reinforcement for the patient to engage in a behavior that's in the patient's best interest. And the bottom line is managed reinforcement contingencies 
are how we learn. They are how patients learned substance use disorder associated behaviors. Why wouldn't we leverage those powerful learning contingencies in the interest of recovery? Next slide. All right. I suppose it's not necessarily bribing or paying someone, but I'm really worried if you provide external reinforcement, that's going to diminish the patient's internal reinforcement, which means when you stop giving them reinforcement, the, the symptoms of the disorder will return. Now, this concern had some serious uh, teeth to it, some support, some, it's some circumstantial support. And that circumstantial report came from evidence in the social psychology literature. Perhaps you're familiar with it. Uh, there was an experiment that elucidated a concept called the overjustification effect. And that experiment looked at children and examined children who like to color in coloring books, as children are wont to do. Children find coloring in coloring books automatically reinforcing. The coloring itself is a reward. But what these researchers did is they took two groups of, of children who liked the color. They provided external rewards for one group to color and not with another group. And what they found was when they withdrew the external rewards, those kids reduced their coloring. Now, that is a challenge. We certainly don't want the provision of external reinforcement to, to when withdrawn, reduce pursuit of recovery behaviors. But actually, that uh, uh, that phenomenon is an apples to oranges situation with CM. It's a misapplication. Why? Because recovery is not an automatically reinforcing set of behaviors. As I mentioned earlier, the initial pursuit of recovery is often unpleasant, withdrawal, loss of social relationships. Granted, that are that are uh, unhealthy in the long run, but very rewarding in the short run, and a clear-eyed view of one of the devastation in one's life. That's why we need immediate reinforcement, because recovery is not immediately automatically reinforcing. And the truth is the majority of evidence in uh, overwhelmingly showed that CM does not reduce internal motivation, but the coup de grace, the most important evidence recently showing that CM most certainly does not reduce internal motivation, came from a meta-analysis. And if you're unfamiliar with meta-analyses, these are the strongest evidence of a phenomenon in the empirical literature. They are studies of studies. And a meta-analysis performed by Meredith Ginley and colleagues, published in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology, one of the most elite journals in behavioral science, show that the effects of CM the abstinence effects, in fact, verified by urine drug testing can endure up to a year, up to a year after the rewards are discontinued, clearly showing that we did not diminish internal motivation because if we had, the effects would not endure. Now, for some patients, next slide. For some patients, the CM effect does stop when we stop CM. And that's to be expected in many cases with a chronic illness. When a patient stops taking his or her antihypertensives or his or her anti-hypercholesterolemia uh, medications, are we not surprised that the hypertension symptoms come back, that cholesterol levels increase? In fact, that evidence shows the treatment was working. Yet I think the problem with applying this critique is that it's somewhat born of stigma of substance use disorders. The expectation that uh, if a treatment when withdrawn doesn't result in long-term uh, uh, dur long durability of effects, the treatment failed. That's not true of treatments of chronic illnesses. We know that consistent treatment is what is most effective. However, that Ginley paper showed that the effect of CM can indeed endure. For some patients, we might see a recurrence of use because the CM may have not been long enough. Perhaps a patient uh, uh, who has a recurrence of symptoms might need it, might have needed a longer course of CM. Unfortunately, the science of CM has not developed the precision yet to know what length of course would be best for which patients. And the other feature of CM that makes this uh, uh, enduring a benefit 
uh, understandable is number one, what I mentioned earlier, the brain gets a chance to heal. Number two, the patient gets to learn to live without the substance in a manner that produces immediate reinforcement. That develops the patient's sense of self-efficacy, the, the sense of I can do this and it's worth doing. Next slide. Harm reduction. Remember at the at, remember at the outset, I said uh, abstinence is a quintessential behavior associated with recovery. And what about harm reduction? Well, CM might be perceived as abstinence only, but in fact, it doesn't compel, coerce, uh, or in other, any other way uh, force a patient to embrace an abstinence goal. It simply says, while this is in place. If you were to experiment with abstinence, if you were to try to abstain for a few days, we're going to reinforce that behavior. And in the process of reinforcing that behavior, we might be able to tip the motivational balance towards enduring abstinence. So we're going to help shape abstinence by targeting, uh, uh, by uh, rewarding the patient for testing negative that immediate reinforcement raises the likelihood of, cons of a repeated performance of that behavior. And for a patient who doesn't embrace an abstinence goal, the only penalty for not completing the target behavior is re withholding and resetting reinforcement, which is no different than if they weren't in CM. They wouldn't be getting any reinforcement in CM, whereas if they're in CM, the opportunity to receive reinforcement is real. Next slide. Diversion of incentives. Now, this is a legitimate concern. Of course, let's let's uh, 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 acknowledge that what CM is about is providing uh, material value reinforcement to patients with a substance use disorder. Is diversion a possibility? Of course, it's a possibility. But interestingly, the science suggests that the risk is not as great as we would suspect. The late David Festinger actually put that that question to the test. He uh, hypothesized that patients in CM who receive cash, the easiest reward to, to divert, would have higher levels of substance use than patients provided merchandise, which requires a little more work to divert. Either you have to sell or trade the merchandise, so you have to find a willing partner in that endeavor. What he found, however, was the patients did not differ in terms of substance consumption. And as I mentioned earlier, there's that self-correction element of CM. If a patient were to divert incentives, they'll test positive, receive no reinforcement, have their reinforcement reset, and the CM is geared to address that recurrence of use. In VA, we have an added benefit that we use um, coupons, known as Veterans Canteen Service coupons, to... Uh, as reinforcement. And the Veterans Canteen Service, which operates the cafeterias, coffee shops, and retail stores, also known as canteens, throughout our enterprise, they don't merchandise any or sell any merchandise that could complicate recovery, like intoxicating beverages, tobacco products, gambling paraphernalia, uh, uh, for example, like lottery tickets. Am I saying that we should capriciously disregard the security and accounting of incentives? Of course not. Maintaining the integrity of the testing process and the procedures and documentation is absolutely essential to CM success. Next slide. All right, I've made a case for CM from a rationale standpoint. Is the juice worth the squeeze? What does the evidence say? Next slide. Meta-analysis after meta-analysis demonstrates over decades of behavioral science research that CM is the most effective treatment for stimulant use disorder. Next slide. A recent uh, uh, meta-analysis by Bensley and colleagues, very powerful, uh, uh, statistically powerful study, 157 studies of treatment for cocaine use disorder were examined. 400, more than 400 treatment groups, more than 15,000 research participants. And I take this quote directly from their paper, only CM programs were significantly associated with an increased likelihood of having a negative test result. Next slide. 
Well, that's the research, Dom. Does this work when you put it in practice in the real world? Well, we had that very interest in VA. And in 2018, we published our, the outcomes of VA's implementation of CM in its first 55 months from June 2011 to December 2015. By that time, we had served over 2,000 veterans with CM in 94 different programs, and the outcomes we observed are comparable to those observed in the empirical research on CM. And that includes 92% of samples testing negative for the target substance. Next slide. Did those outcomes endure? Well, through September 30th of last year, we now have 120 stations. In fact, that has grown since September. We have over 120 stations. Over 6,400 veterans have received CM and 92% of the more than 83,000 urine samples have tested negative for the target drug, typically stimulants, in some cases, cannabis, and we are retaining patients for an average of seven weeks. Next slide. Okay, is it just work with veterans? Absolutely not. Across a wide array of patient subgroups, including, of course, pregnant people, CM can be effective. And in, with respect to pregnant people, you'll notice that I didn't uh, uh, make any digressions away from the protocol or the rationale or the evidence to address pregnant people because there's no evidence what those accommodations need to be made aside from the accommodations that any substance use disorder program might make. For example, attending to the practical needs of pregnant people like childcare needs, potentially transportation needs. Those are not unique to CM, but the CM procedures and its evidence of effectiveness certainly applies to pregnant people. Now, in terms of the reinforcements you might want to make available, uh, certainly consideration of what might be desirable to pregnant people in a CM program, uh, 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 merchandise applicable to early childhood uh, uh, rearing, diapers, uh, uh, diaper disposal processes, wipes, and so on and so forth, baby food, certainly should be a consideration in making CM available to pregnant people. But again, no evidence of any differential loss of effect with pregnant people or across any of these communities of patients, even across income levels. Next slide. So why implement CM? It's needed. We're in the midst of an overdose crisis in the United States. Over 100,000 of our, of our fellow Americans are experiencing a fatal overdose, and this has endured. So we obviously have a need. That overdose crisis is, is driven largely by opioids, but also by stimulants. We have the, the effective evidence-based medications that are life-saving for opioid use disorder. CM can be is life-saving for patients with stimulant use disorder. It's not discipline specific. Psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, addiction therapists, rehab counselors, nurses, advanced practice nurses, and on and on can implement CM because all CM is about is assiduous adherence to the procedures. It's a brief contact. The CM session can be completed in six to 10 minutes. It's low cost. Even voucher CM relatively is low cost. The uh, uh, $500 um, minimum for, for voucher CM should be adjusted upwards of up to about $750, maybe a little bit more to $1,000. But again, to arrest the stimulant use disorder, the trade-off is incredibly beneficial. CM can be combined with any other treatment. And last but not least, it's fun. I am a trainer, as as my uh, as, uh, the introduction mentioned, I'm a trainer in cognitive behavioral therapy. I'm a trainer in motivational interviewing and motivational enhancement therapy. Effective, noble treatments all. I, I use them in my own clinical work, of course, but I've never had a patient after completing a functional analysis of behavior in a course of CBT, jump out of their chair and do a happy dance. And that kind of experience can and does happen with CM. And there's nothing like that vicarious shared moment of joy that we can have 
with patients benefiting from this effective treatment. And with that final slide, thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation today. Uh, you can enter your questions in the chat box right now, and we will get to as many as time will allow for today. Uh, we did want to reiterate for those of you attending live, uh, you must have been present for the <clears throat> entire webinar and complete our evaluation survey in order to receive CE credit. Uh, CEs are available for counselors, social workers, addiction pre prevention professionals, and psychologists, school psychologists. Everyone else will receive a certificate of attendance so that they can submit it to their respective boards for consideration for CEs. Uh, there is a link in the chat right now that you can uh, click on to get to the evaluation right away if you would like to earn credits for uh, attending today. Uh, please also use chat for any questions. Let's get to a few that we have coming in now. Uh, the first question asks, what are some of the biggest barriers that agencies have encountered in terms of implementing contingency management? Great question. And those barriers in part apply to the necessary components of, of contingency management. For example, resourcing of incentives. That's a, a, a major challenge. Um, there are opportunities. The, the state of California is an example that applied for a waiver. It's called an 1115 waiver with Department of Health and Human Services in order to, to uh, apply uh, uh, Med Medicaid dollars to a, a, a CM implementation. And that, that implementation in California is underway. Uh, Dr. Tom Fries, uh, Dr. Beth Rubkowski are leading that terrific subject matter experts in CM. Another concern is the ability to have your staff participate in training and ongoing, ongoing coaching. You don't want coaching uh, to be a temporary involvement because we know that there can be drift from the proper procedures. And then of course, implementing a rapid testing regime. Uh, and in addition, aside from those practical considerations, being prepared to address the good faith, yet I believe misconstruals of contingency management, those critiques that are understandable, but can be refuted by both the rationale and evidence of CM. Our next question asks, uh, it says that we understand that currently federal funding will only allow you to spend up to $30 on incentives. Uh, do you anticipate any changes with federal funding to allow for contingency management? Well, um, there's a, a, a publicly available report to Congress that Department of Health and Human Services published. I can't speak for the Department of Health and Human Services, but I can tell you that the national drug control strategy that applies to VA, that applies to health and human services, and I could, I could tell you that co colleagues in health and human services are enthusiastic about CM. The national drug control strategy published by the Office of National Drug Control Policy in the White House in 2022 is the first national drug control strategy to highlight and emphasize the need to make contingency management available. So I could tell you that there's great enthusiasm and interest in uh, facilitating implementation of CM throughout the country. Okay, uh, next question asks, what typically happens to a person's recovery once contingency management ends? And it really depends on the patient. For some patients, there can be enduring benefit. In fact, the, the reason we use a 12-week course of CM is because that's where the bulk of the evidence is. Does that mean 12 weeks of CM will work for everybody? No, not necessarily. In fact, California is using a longer duration of CM. Now, the trade-offs are these. With a longer duration of CM, you're more likely to beneficially impact a wider number a wider swath of patients, but the trade-off is you're likely to give superfluous CM to patients who could have done well with 12 weeks. And we don't yet have the precision, as I mentioned, to decide 
this length of course for you and that length of course for someone else. Some patients will have enduring benefits. Other patients will have a recurrence of use. Again, that's not of evidence of the failure of the treatment. The treatment may have been for that patient in of insufficient duration. And uh, of course, CM can also be combined with other evidence-based treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy and treatment as usual, which can and should endure beyond the 12 weeks of CM. Thank you. And uh, unless any others slide in at the last moment, our last question asks, what are some of the best reinforces to use in contingency management? That's a great question. I, I like to say that VA is the uh, optimal setting for doing CM because we have this internal currency, this legal tender, if you will, known as the Veterans Canteen Service Coupon System. Those coupons, again, are not uh, 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 coupons in the traditional sense of what you would clip from a Sunday newspaper to get discounts on uh, products at a grocery store. These coupons have cash value, but can be used exclusively in VCS operations, our coffee shops, our cafeterias, and our retail stores throughout the VA. So what makes for the best incentives? The incentives should be of sufficient size, magnitude, consistent with the empirical research. So uh, for voucher CM, we would recommend $750 for a course of CM. Now that's a maximum. Not all the pa not all patients will achieve the maximum. And in price CM, the uh, protocol adjustment of using $3 smalls, uh, small prizes, $20 larges, and $100 and a $100 jumbo price slip, along with the 250 of 500 price slips that have no monetary value, that those uh, values are consistent with a recent paper published by Dr. Carla Rash uh, at the University of Connecticut uh, uh, regarding adjustments to the incentive values to accommodate for cost of living. So those are the, the, the uh, amounts uh, over time, but in addition to amounts, variety. The beauty of our Veterans Canteen Service coupon system is that the veteran, him or herself, can choose to spend those coupons on any of a wide array of, of products from coffee, uh, cups of coffee uh, uh, and, and uh, pastries at our coffee shops to chocolate bars or other candy at our uh, at our uh, retail stores up unto up to and including laptops and and flat screen TVs and it's the patient's discretion to choose uh, how much and when to spend of their earnings some patients like to save up for larger ticket items other patients prefer to spend as they earn and the evidence suggests that either uh, a, a choice can be beneficial which could be a little counterintuitive. You might say, shouldn't we encourage patients to delay the spending of their incentives, to delay the gratification? While that might seem intuitive, bear in mind that the patient who has tested negative for stimulants already has accomplished a delay in gratification. They've, they've checked that behavioral box. And what we want is for their experience of the reinforcement associated with that successful behavior to be as powerful for that patient as possible. So the discretion of whether to spend now, which might be for some patients very exciting, or spend later on larger ticket items, which might be more exciting for other patients, should be left to the patient's discretion. And one follow-up comment we had from one of our participants suggested, uh, possibly using gift cards instead of cash yeah. may be a help for those of us who don't have access to the resources that the VA does. Great point. Yes. In fact, cash is not recommended for all the reasons you would imagine. Cash is, it can be easily diverted, though the study by, by David Festinger suggests that risk is not as great as one might presume. That said, the advantage of using gift cards or even smart gift cards, smart gift cards being gift cards that are programmed such that they cannot be used to purchase items that would complicate recovery. They couldn't be used to purchase alcoholic beverages, lottery tickets, weapons, 
pornographic materials and uh, and so forth, those kind of gift, gift cards can be particularly useful in CM because again, they provide the patient the opportunity to select from a wide array of potential incentives. And our final comment today comes from another one of our viewers who said, I love Dr. Dave Filippi's enthusiasm. This has been a great webinar and I have learned so much. Thank you for your time and expertise. And I will be able to use this information immediately. That is the best feedback I could possibly receive. I thank you for your forbearance with our technical difficulties. I'm hoping most can be edited out from the enduring content, but it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, uh, colleagues at Marshall Health, at West Virginia Department of Human Services, at Quality Insights. You've been terrific to work with. I've, I'm delighted to have had this opportunity and thank you all for attending today. I wish you the best in your noble continued work in serving the best interests of patients with substance use disorder. We are saving lives. And thank you so much for your expertise today. And thank you to everyone for joining us for reinforcing recovery with contingency management for pregnant and parenting people. We'll see you next time on our next webinar coming up in April. You can be on the lookout for information to register for this uh, webinar on wound care and xylazine. It will be April 30th, 2024 at 10 a.m. You can scan the QR code on your screen now or sign up for any of our communications through our uh, Get Connected e-newsletter or morning memo. Uh, on behalf of everyone associated with Healthy Connections, Quality Insights, and the West Virginia Behavioral Health Workforce and Health Equity Training Center at Marshall University. Thank you for your time and have a great day.